Good evening. You're watching The Digital Age, and I'm James Goodale. Earlier this week, the New York Times ran a huge story on Abu Zubaydah. He is one of the 9-11 terrorists who's being tried at Guantanamo. The Times reported that he denied all involvement with 9-11 and his plea that he was, in fact, tortured. But the New York Times reported that the details of his torture were stricken from the record. But we know here on Digital Age that Gerald Posner, one of our guests, has all the details of the alleged torture. When Zubaydah was captured, he was given a truth serum and he was given a pain-killing serum. And when he didn't want to talk, the pain-killing serum was stopped. Uh, and when he did, uh, it was put on again. Now, I want to show you the show I did with Mr. Posner about Zubaydah. It's a great show. I taped it a few years ago. He also talks about Mr. Mohammed, who is the mastermind of the 9-11 plot. And I think you will find this an enormously rewarding experience to watch my show again. Thank you. 9-11 was a digital problem. It could not have happened, we believe, without the computer, without the technology that is run by the computer. And therefore, the digital age has, over the last couple of years, been looking into the causes of 9-11. And that's what we want to do tonight. And we want to ask our guest tonight, who is Gerald Posner, who's to blame? But we'll get to that in a moment. And I just thought I would tell the audience the way I see the chronology, OK? You seem to say in this book, hey, look, the uh, Al Qaeda has been around for a long time. Here's what they've done. Yemen, 1992. World Trade Center, 1993. Mogadishu, 1993. Rioter. Not pronouncing these correctly, doing my best. 1995, Sudan, 1996, Duran, 1996, Kenya, 1998, Cole, 2000, and the World Trade Center in 2001. Now, I don't see every day a list like that, but when you add it all up, I think it's your theory. If you have eight events before you have the big one, the ninth one, we should have known. Is that your idea? Absolutely. Not only should we have known you have these eight events beforehand, but interspersed among those eight events are other things happening that we stop that add to 9, 10, and 11. For instance, we stopped the so-called Day of Terror in New York City. The blind Sheikh Rockman and his yeah. followers wanted to blow up New York City landmarks, bridges, and tunnels. So there's one that was on the agenda. Rabbi Meyer Kahana gets killed here in 1990 by a lone gunman who ends up having ties to all of the radicals who blow up the World Trade Center or try to the first time around. And while these explosions, attacks, and terror strikes are taking place, guess what's happening in Tehran and other places? That they're having terror summit meetings. Al Qaeda sending representatives. They're having open meetings in Iran calling for a war against Jews and Christians in which Al-Qaeda keeps saying we're coming after you and nobody over here is listening. And then we break up other plots in the Philippines in the mid-90s in which they want to blow up 10 airliners over the Pacific. They want to fly a plane into CIA headquarters. There are little things that happen along the way, James. Remember there was a Pakistani national who went in front of CIA headquarters and shot the place up and killed four workers one day, later tied into Al-Qaeda. So we had plenty of warnings, but no one was sitting there in the government in any administration saying, by the way, this is a concerted war against us. They looked at these as isolated criminal justice problems, and that's the issue. All right, well, let me, uh, I've got these, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, fill-in with, the, with these dates, and um, I accept it. I want to just go back and ask you about one event in the chronology, and that's the World Trade Center uh, disaster in 1993. Is it your view that al-Qaeda was behind that? The funding of it. It wasn't an al-Qaeda operation in the sense that Osama bin Laden was sitting out there in, the, in, at that time, the Sudan. He was in Khartoum running a number of businesses and said, you know what, let's go after this operation. This was really more of an operation homegrown in terms of the blind sheikh, Rockman, and his followers, but they were funded by two different front companies, which we now know were al-Qaeda. We didn't know that until 97 and 98 after the prosecution was already finished on the first World Trade Center. So people who are interested in it can go into the court files, can go into the exhibits, you can see the links between the Al-Qaeda funding. So what Bin Laden knew was this. He didn't know what was gonna happen, but he knew that he was funding good allies in the United States who were trying to spread jihad in America. And they did. They tried to bring down the World Trade Centers. So his money was well spent, but he didn't have the operational control of that. Well, now there is the, Fascinating figure in, in this book, uh, Khalil 
S. Mohammed. And Khalil S. Mohammed, I understand, was on the front page. No, that was Zabuda was on the front page. No, no, you're it was, right. It was, it was Muhammad. It was right? Muhammad. Yeah. Oh, Muhammad was on the front page uh, of the New York Post, and he's uh, recently been captured. Now, one of the things that's interested me about K.S. Mohammed is that he apparently is related to Ramzi Youssef. Now, listeners who've followed this show know that we've been very interested in Ramzi Youssef, because you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. Ramzi Youssef defended himself in court and did a heck of a job, Mary Jo White has told us. He also had a computer that apparently couldn't be broken. But anyway, he apparently is the nephew of a Khalid, but Khalid is older than Ramsey. But, that, but, but that's not the point. The point is that Ramsey Youssef, everyone knows, and I'll remind the audience, was connected with the 1993 WTC. Now, uh, KS has been telling uh, everybody he's the mastermind of most everything for Al-Qaeda. And uh, so the question I keep coming up with is, here is nephew, uh, clearly did the 1993 World Trade Center, and he's related to Muhammad. Is the idea that, nonetheless, as you say, Muhammad wasn't talking with uh, bin Laden about that? No, I think that Muhammad was talking about oh, bin Laden were. about it, but here's the key. Muhammad's association with bin Laden really starts about 94, 95. So Muhammad yeah. is a player on his own. So Khalid Sheikh Muhammad is a player in international terror, but not everybody in international terror is al-Qaeda. His connections in the early days were more to Iran, and he had some Iranian money backing him. He hooks up with bin Laden really around the time of Mogadishu and Somalia, 93, 94. So bin Laden and Muhammad become a pair then, and Muhammad keeps moving up in the organization. So I have no doubt that Khalid Sheikh Muhammad, yes, his fingerprints could well be behind Ramzi Yusuf in the first World Trade Center bombing. And I have no doubt that al-Qaeda money from Osama bin Laden yeah. is behind the bomb that killed the people and wounded over, uh, you know, a thousand. But in terms of bin Laden having the same control that he had on the second attack, it was a little different. So um, we talked. You talked about Meyer Kahani. Did I pronounce his name yes, right? Yes, correctly. And that's 1990. Right. That was a big story in, in New York because he was gunned down right in the middle of a hotel lobby. Is that right? Absolutely. And, and you know, everybody thought, okay, right wing Israeli politician who's talking about uh, Arabs as though they're less than worthy of living. No wonder he finally had an Arab stand up and say, you, you're not worthy of living, and shoot him. And people just said, it's one man, one gun. That's the end of it. But this is the, my favorite part. The FBI in 1989, the year before, had received a tip that there might be some fundamentalists and radicals from a local mosque in New Jersey that Sheikh Rockman was at that might want to bomb a New Jersey casino. So they followed a few of them, and one of them turned out to be Nasser Said, Said Nasser, who kills Kahana a year later. They go to a rifle range out in Long Island. They photograph him with four other Arabs with him, and they put the photographs in their files, and they forget about it. After he shoots Kahana, no one goes to figure out who, are in the other, uh, who the other Arabs are in the pictures. It turns out that three of them are arrested for World Trade Center One, and one of them is arrested in the day of terror plot bombing in 1995 in New York. El Said Nasser, who killed Kahana, was connected to all of the radicals who would play a role in terrorism in the next few years in New York, and his own papers taken out of his apartment were a blueprint to terrorist activities, but we didn't translate them for three years. No. This is how we were operating then. Do I remember correctly from your book that you uh, suggest that there was al-Qaeda financing for Kahana, or did I make that up? Uh, no, uh, for Kahana, I can't establish that there was any financing directly from al-Qaeda, although they didn't have to in the sense it was, it was literally an operation of an $85 pistol. So it, it but was The point I'm getting at is these early, these early years, uh, there's the sentiment and there's the desire to be a terrorist, but as we move forward past World Trade Center in 1993, then uh Bin Laden is able to organize it better. Is that, is that what happens? Absolutely. Yeah, and okay. also, Bin Laden is encouraged to organize it better, and I'll tell you why. The, there are two things that happened in 93 that are critical. One you've just hit on, which is the first World Trade Center attack. Right. When that takes place, Bin Laden looks at our response, and guess what our response is? Nothing. By his standards, it's nothing. We make it a criminal justice case. <coughs> we go out and we look for the people like Ramsey Yusuf. We eventually right. run them to ground. We get them, put them on trial, and they get sent to jail. 
No country gets attacked. No infrastructure right. gets attacked. No terrorist training center gets right. attacked. Then in 93, there's another test of American will. That's Somalia. We go in there, and bin Laden now decides it's his operation. Right. He's going to embarrass us. They bring the Black Hawk down. And what's the response? We withdraw our troops from Somalia. So now he feels, guess what? He was in Afghanistan in the 80s. He fought the Soviet Union for right. 10 years. They were the world's other superpower. They lost tens right. of thousands dead. They eventually lose the war. But they put up a good fight. America, on the other hand, you bloody their nose, you send them a few body bags, and they say, oh, no. We're concerned about our 401ks and getting a second SUV, but we really don't want to lose anybody no, no, in the you're battle. You're talking, talking, talking about the mid-'90s now. That's okay, right. so uh, we see there's a lot of evidence that is missed in the connection, which we can now see from your excellent book. And now we're talking about what's going on basically at the very top in, in the White House, okay? This is the period of time that you're talking about. Now, in your book, you talk about the chance we had to, quotes, capture, close quotes, bin Laden. And this happened when he went to, uh, where did he go? Yeah, he Yemen? goes, for, he, he, he leaves, you're Sudan. right, he leaves the Sudan, and he's flying up now to Pakistan and Afghanistan. This is 1996. Right. Now, I say hindsight's 2020, so it's easy for me to sit here and say, oh, oh God, look, you guys all made too, mistakes. Being too nice. Yeah, no, but ahead. Okay, and so, yeah. so I think these decisions in the Clinton administration were made with the best intentions. It wasn't right. as though they knew what was coming up. They would make them differently today, right. knowing 9-11, but at that time, first of all, we are told that he's leaving the Sudan to fly up, and he's not flying on a little plane underneath the radar. He's right. rented, chartered a giant right. C-130. He's right. got his family and all his top aides aboard, including your friend K.S. Muhammad. Um, it's, oh, yes, K.S. Muhammad? Muhammad's like on that flight. So is our here. He's on, yeah, it's 130 of, uh, I mean, it's terror central. So it's a real opportunity right. to take out the core of al-Qaeda. Right. The CIA comes with a plan for extraction. I love that word by the CIA, extraction. Yeah, it sounds like a tooth that you're going attraction. to the dentist, right? Um, take, take, it, take, him it, take him out of the plane. Take him out of the plane in international airspace, goes to the White House, and the White House says, all right, let's ask the Saudis. The Saudis have a warrant for al-Qaeda. So yeah. we say, do you want them? And the Saudis say, this should have been the first evidence the Saudis weren't serious about taking yeah. them. They said, uh, not this week, thanks, we'll pass. So we go to the Egyptians, say, do you want them? They say no. Right. And now the administration has to decide the tough question, do we want them? Right. They've said for history that we didn't think we could convict them. Not true. We thought we could convict him. We didn't want him in an American jail because we thought we'd be subject to reprisals all over the world. It wasn't worth it. And the decision was made, send him up to Afghanistan and Pakistan. He'll get lost in the wilds up there and no one will hear from him again. That's what Big mistake. All right, now, who made that decision? Now, as I read it, it would have been the National Security Advisor, Sandy Berger, and it must have been the President. Well, there's nobody take, no one raising their hand that says that decision was made. The CIA says we were turned down on our plan. That's right. clear. Sandy Berger says, not me, I didn't do it. Clinton says, not me, I didn't do it. They both say they didn't uh, do it? Yeah, they, and, and so I can't find out what, and, and this is quite interesting, you'll appreciate this. Gutter, our Middle East ally, this little Gulf state, calls the embassy, the American embassy, because bin Laden's plane arrives there to refuel right. on the way up to Pakistan and says, by the way, we want you to know that Osama bin Laden's arriving here. We don't want to do anything that's going to insult you in the United States. And the embassy says, let him fly on. Now, Berger and others have said, they never asked us. Those were low-level officials. Right. So my point is you can't have it both ways, fellows. Look, either you made a mistake in that Osama bin Laden's name wasn't red flagged, which it should have been by 1996, right. so the minute a call came in from another country saying, by the way, we've got something on Osama bin Laden, right. it should have gone right up to the National Security Council, and it should have been on Sandy Berger's desk. Yeah. Or it did arrive on the desk, and somehow they just aren't well, fessing now, up now, to but it. Before that, there was a back-channel effort by a businessman. That's right. And uh, the businessman said that he talked to, I'm not sure, to whom he talked. He talked to Berger. Now he said. No, he talked to Berger. Right. And Berger. Oh, okay. okay now, I, so we finally have Sandy okay, Berger in we the picture. Now we put Sandy Berger in our and, sights. And, right. And right. Sandy Berger says, um, you know, we never thought those were serious. We still believe to this day he just was about trying to do a business deal and uh, Sudan was never going to follow up. But the ambassador to Sudan at the time uh, says, and somebody in the State Department who was r running Africa says, no, we thought they were serious. We never gave them the chance to show their bona fides. And that's unfortunate because I think that was an opportunity missed in retrospect. There was a, an alleged back-channel effort from Iraq to inform the United States government, allegedly, that a deal could be made. And the U.S. government said, 
we don't deal with back channel efforts. You know, we deal when people come and talk to us face to face, face to face. But you know, they didn't quite say this, but I think right. in that effect, our experience is you don't go around the, the fringes and and do deals of, of this nature. It seemed to me that response is somewhat comparable to the one perhaps that Sandy Berger gave. And Sandy Berger at that time was the National Security Advisor. He was the Condoleezza Rice That's of right. that particular time. Do you think it's possible that we weren't culturally attuned as to how Arabs do business? And that was yes. one of the problems in dealing with the capture. We could have had bin Laden, Boy, save 9-11. You, you know, you're one of the first people to, to pull that out, and I think it's absolutely critical. I've learned time and time again in doing this that we fail to appreciate their culture. We don't understand how they do things. And it's, it's anybody who has been, I've been to Morocco, and if you've been to other countries, you walk through the bazaar and you'll know never pay the first price you're offered on the item that you want to buy. You've got to start to haggle and negotiate. It's a process of back channel negotiations and talking and haggling, and maybe you get a little bit of what you want and you don't get anything. Um, ask the Israelis who have been talking for years with, the, you know, uh, 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 with their neighbors about possible peace deals, and they may understand it better than we do. But clearly, the administration did not appreciate what they had to there, do there's an issue also uh, of pride that I didn't make up, but which has been talked about a lot with respect to Iraq, that we didn't uh, take into account the pride of Iraqis uh, who may not have wanted to tell us that they destroyed the weapons because that would humiliate them. Uh, the pride they take in having a guerrilla action, so forth and so on. Uh, perhaps in dealing with the Arab world, we don't understand how much pride plays uh, part of their actions. So we have to go around, we have to go around the edges. Maybe we're not just fit out to do this at all. But, but I think that we are in this sense because we have effectively done it with the Saudis for years. And what I mean by oh, that I is see, yeah. until we had troops on Saudi soil after the first Iraqi invasion right. of Kuwait, the Saudis were providing us backdoor help for years, yeah. but n always so. appearing they had nothing to do with the infidel. Right. And Syria is doing the same thing today. Syria is providing us backdoor help on the terrorism, saying to us in so many ways, don't come here, by the way. Don't move west from right. Iraq. Right. Stay over where you are, but we'll help you out behind the scenes. So we do have uh, some experience, and you pointed out earlier, of, of connecting the dots. But I want to talk about connecting the dots a little bit more with respect to what was going on in the intelligence efforts of the government, what was going on in the White House. One example I, I would give you, and it relates to what we were just talking about. We were talking about handing over uh, bin Laden in 1996. Six. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, bin Laden was indicted. And one would, would have to think, well, he was indicted because the conversation that we hear back with respect to the extraction from the plane was, we can't convict him. Well, that's not like a saying, well, we can't indict him, we can't convict him, why do we indict him? So he gets, he gets indicted thereafter. Um, but guess what happened? We found out on this show that while he was indicted here in, 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 in New York, that the National Security Council, National Security Advisor, and the National Security Council, which are the people who are responsible for everything we've just been talking about, didn't know about it. It's remarkable. It's what, you know, you talk about one arm not knowing what the other arm is doing. Yeah. This is only the world's biggest terrorist at the time, Bin Laden. He's been, he's number one on the list. The State Department's calling him the biggest financier of terror in 1996. You get a secret sealed indictment of him here in New York, and the National Security Council is making the decision as to whether we should extract him or not doesn't even know that he's indicted, but they're making their own call as to whether he can be convicted. It's really shameful. There, there are very few people here that can hold their head up with any pride in the lead up to 9-11. Uh, the people who sought the indictment on bin Laden are some of the few who were pursuing the right thing, but the rest of the government not knowing it is really remarkable. Let's talk about Clinton. How much fault is Clinton's? Well, here, here's my overall view. When I am on... Just remember now, you've got to pick one of these. I'm giving you a lot, yeah, of, no, cho no, 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 right. lot of choices. You've got to right. pick one at the end. I'm, hard on, I'm hard on Clinton, yeah. there's no question, and I voted for Clinton twice. I'm hard on him because eight of the ten years leading up to 9-11 fell on his watch. I believe wholeheartedly that if eight of the ten years leading up to 9-11 had fallen on a Republican watch, I'd be chastising them just as hard because I don't think there would have been any difference. The last 
You don't think it'd be any different? No, I really don't. The, uh, I don't the Republicans think might not have had Monica Lewinsky. Uh, it, but the Monica Lewinsky wasn't the difference of really being distracted here. I, I know that well, there it was were a bit of a distraction. It, uh, yes, it was a distraction, but yeah. Clinton was distracted from terror anyway. What I mean by that, it would be one thing if I could say to you that Clinton was zeroing in on the problem of international terrorism and Osama bin Laden before Monica Lewinsky, and that once that came up and he had to worry about impeachment, he lost his interest. He wasn't interested from day one. I talked to the head of the CIA here, James Woolsey, who just says, I met with him once in two years. On World Trade Center 1 in 1993, he had to be forced almost to mention in a weekly radio address. He never visited the site, never addressed it, never asked for okay. a briefing from the FBI. So it wasn't on his radar. Okay, now let's, let's defend Clinton in terms of what's on his radar. What gets on Clinton's radar because he's such a smart thing? There are a lot of things he thinks about, but of course, the staff has to put things. So no. let's go down oh, no. to the next level. Oh, no, I agree. This is a problem for the National Security Council, and this is also a problem from the people who are paid billions of dollars who are supposed to be protecting us, the CIA. The CIA is the one. The, the CIA director says to me, I'm ostracized from the White House. You know what? You are the CIA director. You can do things about that as well, and you can get the president's attention if you want to, but nobody in Langley thought this was a problem either. Okay, let's talk about someone else to blame for 9-11. Well, I'll tell you, I blame... Wait, wait, I've got... Okay, my, okay. It's my... I've got an idea. <laughs> Don't tell me. I've got plenty to blame as well. Uh, Arabs. Yeah, well, uh, uh, t here's the problem when I say Arabs. Oh, well, I want, what, what I, I mean, Saudi Arabia. That's yes, Arabs. Okay. That's a, that, the, I shouldn't have said that. Well, no, but when you say Arabs, I would only chastise the uh, moderate Muslims for not speaking out and reigning in their religion from the, the radicals. But the Saudis, yes, the, uh, our, our so-called allies, the Pakistanis, now our allies since 9-11, up to their eyeballs in terror. From 1991, the current ambassador to the Court of St. James, the ambassador to the United Kingdom, Prince Turkey uh, bin Faisal, who was head of Saudi intelligence just by coincidence for 25 years, resigned 10 days before 9-11. He thinks this is a scurrilous book. He's called me a liar. He thinks it's absolutely filled with falsehoods. Maybe that's because I say he made a secret deal with bin Laden in 1991 in which he said to bin Laden, you know, bin Laden, be a good Saudi pr prince. You leave the kingdom. Go and play jihad somewhere else, and we will allow tens of millions of dollars to flow to you from these charities in Saudi Arabia, which they did, and then it'll be like professional wrestling. Once in a while, with a wink and a nod, we'll ask for your extradition from some other country, but we won't really mean it. When the Americans went to him in 96, he was flying up from the Sudan and said, do you want him Saudi Arabia? They said no. They were never serious about getting him. And this is the deal they made to keep the terrorism away from the kingdom have it somewhere else, and now they've lost that. They bought themselves 10 years. Terrorism's finally returned there from May so they, on. How long ship. are the payments going? Are they make them in 1998 also? They went after 9-11, and this is the part of the embarrassment. That's they made payments after 9-11? After 9-11, they continue to flow the money to al-Qaeda, and that's the, and that's the part that I believe. I don't think Saudi Arabia had any planning or operational role in 9-11. I do believe, however, that what they are embarrassed about is they continue to allow money to flow to al-Qaeda afterwards because Saudi Arabia is concerned about one thing, their own survival, and that means they've got to keep al-Qaeda at bay. All right, let's talk about some of the Saudi, Saudi Arabians who paid the money. And uh, this comes out of the interrogation of the favorite person in your book. It's not funny, but I mean, you, no. it's so bizarre that you have to smile a little bit. And that's Mr. Zubad. Da. Zubaida, Abu Zubaida, Zubaida. And Abu he, Zubaida. And he uh, even becomes more of an interesting character than K.S. Muhammad in this sense because he's the, the top-ranking al-Qaeda operative when he's caught in March of 2002. He's behind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in terms of rank. He's about fourth in the organization, but he's wounded when we catch him in western Pakistan. So the Americans interrogate him hard for three days, and he hardly gives his name. So then they come up with this clever idea. Let's move him over to a safe compound in Afghanistan. He's in Pakistan. We'll make the room look like it's a Saudi jail. We have two special American forces play Saudi interrogators. And Zubaida will see them as Saudis and say, uh-oh, these guys use real torture, not just like the Americans, a bit of pushing you around. And they give you a 20-minute trial and then behead you. I'm going to spill the beans. So they set up this operation. The fake Saudis come in. And instead of being afraid, what does he do? Zubaida says, here call this number up and gives a number from memory that turns out to be the private cell phone number of the nephew of the king of Saudi Arabia, a guy, Prince Ahmad, uh, and, uh, and Prince Ahmed bin, uh, bin Tur uh, Faisal on this, is a fellow who runs the largest media empire in the kingdom. He's 42 years old at that time. And uh, he's like the Rupert Murdoch of Saudi Arabia. Right. He also owns the uh, war emblem, the winner of the Kentucky Derby in 2002. And in his spare time, wait, he spent wait. $125 million buying racehorses in America, this prince. 
This is the prince's phone number that comes out? This is the prince's phone number. Now wait, he says he'll tell you what to do. So the Americans can't figure out what to do with this information. So yeah. they come back, they check the number out, it checks out, right. and they say to Zubaida, you're a liar. So Zubaida is now playing his get-out-of-jail-free right. card. He gives the name of two other Saudi princes, right. both of them related to the king, uh, one an ex-military man and one a younger prince, and then he throws in the head of the Pakistan Air Force, like their joint right, chiefs right, of right. staff, and right. says he's been our supplier for money and arms for six years. Now, and wait, let me... No. Now we've got, I, don't want to, I know what you're about to say, but I just want to build up the crescendo here a little bit. Okay, so we have four people who are named. And one is the Kentucky Derby winner. I don't remember reading that in your book. Yeah, that's in, your, yeah, that's in a, your book? Yeah, it might have been a okay. footnote. You know, I threw too many footnotes in. <laughs> the, All right, let's see, let's see what happened. What happened to him? Well, unfortunately, we told the Saudis and Pakistanis what we learned from Zubaida. And about a month after we told them, this fellow went in for some intestinal surgery, diverticulitis, in the Saudi capital of Riyadh. Yeah. He's a prince. Two days later, he's dead. The doctors say, 43 years old, he must have had a blood clot. This is my favorite part, James. They said, I've asked them, pursued this. You know, after surgery, you're supposed to walk around so you don't get right. a blood clot? They said he didn't walk as, as much as he should have, and he was a prince, so we really couldn't tell him what to do. All right. So, so he's there gone. There goes him. They, number, they, number two. What next, number two? Next day, number two, 41-year-old Prince Sultan, driving a car on the way to the first one's funeral, no other car involved, runs off the side of the road, hits a tree, dead. The Saudis say he must have been driving too fast. All, All right. right. Number three. Three days later, the third prince named by Zubaida, just by coincidence, Prince Fahd, 25 years old, 55 miles outside the Saudi capital of Riyadh, dies. This is my personal favorite. The official cause of death is, quote, of thirst. Of so, thirst. Now, he dies of dehydration. So now listen, he, he must have... He's a prince. He must have forgotten to take in his Rolls Royce an extra bottle of Evian when he went out to the desert, <laughs> so he's a goner. Now, the, the follow-up is our friend in Pakistan, the head of the oh, Air well, Force. Let's just, let's just let's slow down, a little, okay. introduce this so, a little bit, because uh, Pakistan is heavily involved in the dealings with Al-Qaeda. and that, their and, and, their deal, and the dealings, as I understand it, are through what is known as ISI. That's the Pakistan Secret Service. Now, for the viewers who watch this show or read, they may not know about ISI. I don't know that much about it, except that I do know it's highly uncontrollable in the ordinary course. The uh, government usually doesn't know exactly what the ISI is doing, and a lot of people thought the ISA was doing, ISA was doing a lot of things with Al-Qaeda. Right. Now, we're talking with, what's the guy's title in the ISA? Uh, now, he's actually the head of the Air Force. He's like the, Oh, he's the not in the ISA. Yes, yeah, so he's... So he's not even in the ISA. He's, okay. Right, so... He's he, in the Air Force. Right, okay. he's got his friends over there in Pakistani yeah. intelligence, but he's running the Pakistan Air Force. He's the fourth-ranking military officer in all of Pakistan in a military right. country with Musharraf. And he makes the mistake of getting on one of his own military aircraft. The pilot is changed at the last moment. His regular pilot's replaced with right. a new one. It takes off with his wife and 15 of his top aides aboard with ear witnesses on the ground hear an explosion. They're all dead. Uh, that one's still being investigated. Pakistan's looking to see if they can find the cause of that. So just by coincidence, right. all four people named by Zubaida, given to the Americans, die of heart attacks, car wrecks, plane right. crashes, or dehydration right. in the desert okay, so shortly after we find we've out. We've got about two seconds left. And we've got a lot of candidates, one of which is the Arabs, one of which is Clinton, one of which is our own failure to watch all the details. And I'm sure there are other causes, but can you name one to blame for 9-11? One is too tough. Who's to blame? They all are. Thank you very Me. much, Gerald Posner, Thank for you, coming James. by. And thank you for coming by and come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night.